I'm going to talk to you guys about complete transposition of the great vessels. This is more commonly known as DTGA. It's a little bit of a complex disease, you'd say. It comprises a wide variety of lesions. And so there's a lot to go over. I think I'm going to just focus a little bit more on simple detransposition and more of the historical and the most common um, surgical options that um, have been offered to patients with more simple DTGA. I'd like to start off with the case. I saw a 42 year old scuba diver in clinic for the first time after he was lost to follow up for about 20 years. He was referred to our ACHD clinic because he started having progressive palpitations that were limiting his quality of life. He was born with transposition, ventricular septal defect, and had a mustard procedure when he was five months old. Eventually, he had to have an atrial lead placed because he developed sinus node dysfunction. And then he outgrew that lead and that lead became malfunctional. So they tried to go in and put in another atrial lead, but they weren't able to do that. So he ended up having a ventricular lead placed. So this was his first EKG when he came to clinic. And that EKG gave me palpitations. <laughs> Obviously, he's got significant sinus node dysfunction, significant sinus bradycardia, and demand ventricular pacing, PVCs and PV PACs. It's basically all of the arrhythmias together in one EKG. So we ended up getting an echocardiogram. And my palpitations and his palpitations got worse. <clears throat> and on his echo, he had normal LV systolic function. But he had a really dilated right ventricle. The right ventricle was dysfunctional, and he had significant TR, and his TR jet was over four. So let's stop there for now, and we'll go over kind of the basics of detransposition of the great arteries. For those of you who are less familiar with the um, lesion, we all know the normal heart anatomy. We know that deoxygenated blood gets pumped into the pulmonary circulation by way of the right ventricle. And we know that oxygenated blood returns to the left heart and gets pumped into the systemic circulation by way of the left ventricle. But things are mixed up in detransposition. The great vessels are switched. And so the aorta comes off of the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery comes off of the left ventricle. And now you get two circulations in parallel instead of in series. Your deoxygenated blood returns to your heart and gets pumped back into your systemic circulation by way of the right ventricle, and your oxygenated blood returns to the left side of the heart and gets pumped back into your lungs by way of the left ventricle. And in the absence of any intracardiac shunting, obviously that's incompatible with life for the most part. It occurs in about two out of 10,000 births, and it has a prevalence of five to 7% of all congenital heart defects. Prior to surgical repair of these lesions, about 90% of those who were born with DTGA died by the time they were a year old. And now, about 90% of those born with DTGA survive into other adults. So initially, I think someone had mentioned it um, earlier this morning, initial repair uh, or initial attempts at repair really were anatomic attempts meaning they tried the atrial switch procedure way back in the 1950s. But for the most part, that procedure was unsuccessful and there was a high mortality rate, and a lot of it had to do with trying to figure out what to do with the coronary arteries. Things really didn't work at that point, and so in the 1950s, late 1950s, the atrial switch operation started became, becoming the more um, preferred mode of uh, surgery for these patients. In the atrial switch operation, either autologous atrial tissue or synthetic material, the senning or the mustard procedures, are used to create a baffle inside the atria of the heart. And the goal of this baffle is to redirect blood flow. So the baffle redirects oxygenated blood from the pulmonary venous blood flow to the right side of the heart, to the right ventricle, to the systemic circulation. And the systemic venous baffle redirects deoxygenated blood from the systemic venous return to the left side of the heart to the pulmonary circulation. And if you're lucky enough 
to be in an institution where our sonographers are amazing, you can see these baffles on echocardiogram. For the most part, we don't, a lot of those times it's just difficult to see baffles, but this is a great example of a superior limb of a systemic venous baffle right here in the top right hand corner, um, uh, redirecting blood to the left heart. And here, as we sweep more posteriorly, we see the pulmonary ve uh, venous baffle redirecting blood now to the right heart, or right side of the heart, I should say. So let's go back to the first case. My patient had normal LV function, he had a really dilated right ventricle, and he had right ventricular dysfunction, and he had significant TR. It's not uncommon for those who are unfamiliar with this lesion and this repair to mistake these findings for pulmonary hypertension. In reality, what we're seeing here is a, is a systemic right ventricle that's dysfunctional. And this TR jet that we're seeing correlates with systemic um, arterial pressures. But not all was well and good. In the 1970s, early 1980s, people started noticing that in the long term, these patients didn't do so well. The most common complication that happened in the long term post mustard or sending procedure are tachyarrhythmias. And these tachyarrhythmias can come from both the ventricle and or the atria. The most common atrial tachyarrhythmia that we see is intraatrial, uh, intraatrial reentry tachycardia. And it's typically a pathway that's located right next to the baffle suture lines. Early on post-op at about 10 years follow-up, only about 12% of these patients uh, will develop tachyarrhythmias. But by the time they're 25 years post-op, the majority of them will have tachyarrhythmias. Now these are patients who are 20 or 30s who present to the ER with atrial tach. Not only can you have tachyarrhythmias, you can have bradyarrhythmias. About 50% of patients by 20 years post-op develop bradyarrhythmias, and about 11% of patients end up needing a pacemaker placed. And if you're lucky, like my patient, you get both. You get tachybrady syndrome, all wrapped up in a nice 42-year-old scuba diving package. Perhaps the more concerning or the most concerning issue that we started to see post atrial switch procedure was the development of ventricular failure of the um, systemic right ventricle. By 12 years post-op, and this is a study that was actually done in all patients with um, systemic right ventricles, so that included um, CCTGAs. So by 12 years post-op, these patients with systemic right ventricles um, about a third of them ended up having developing some degree of uh, systemic right ventricular dysfunction. And by the time they're 45, over two thirds of these patients are gonna have systemic right ventricular dysfunction. A little word about systemic right ventricular dysfunction. It's a little bit hard to manage these patients with a systemic right ventricle. Because you know when you're trying to use goal-directed medical therapy for heart failure, that stuff, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, the data out there is really mixed. And it hasn't been shown to have as promising outcomes in these patients with uh, systemic right ventricles as it has been in patients of, with a normal biventricular um, anatomy. And as if that wasn't enough, we have to deal with these intraatrial baffles. So about a fourth of patients end up getting intraatrial baffle leaks and a minority of them get baffle obstructions. And these baffle obstructions, the incidence increases with the presence of transvenous lines. So these baffle obstructions and these baffle um, leaks end up being a really big issue that needs to be dealt with, especially in these patients who end up needing pacemakers eventually. And you need to address the baffle um, obstructions before you go in and you put in a transvenous uh, pacemaker line. I've seen a couple of patients now um, who have had inferior limb um, obstruction of the systemic venous baffle that was missed, and they ended up getting cirrhosis because of um, high central venous pressures. So, you know, people started noticing these uh, complications after the atrial switch procedure, 
and the surgical techniques for, uh, for the uh, anatomic repair of the arterial switch procedure started getting better. So that by the 1980s, people figured out how to work with these coronary arteries. And by the late 1980s, the arterial switch procedure ended up becoming more and more popular. And so the whole premise behind the arterial switch procedure is that you transect the great arteries, the aorta and the pulmonary artery above the sinuses. You take the coronary buttons and you remove them from the wall of the aorta by way of coronary artery buttons. And then you reanastomose them to their opposite roots. And so you have what we term as the anatomic repair. And many of these patients, they get the LeCompte maneuver which we see here on the CT, where the pulmonary artery and the branch pulmonary arteries are pulled anterior and they lay on top of the aorta. And so the outcomes for the arterial switch procedure are much better, we think, than the atrial switch procedure. There's better survival, about 95% survive by 25 years post-op and you take away the issue with the systemic right ventricle and right ventricular dysfunction or failure. And so less than 20% of these patients in 30 year follow-up end up having any kind of ventricular dysfunction. But let me introduce you to another patient. He's a 20 year old, uh, 21 year old man. He's very active. He was born with transposition of the right arteries with intact ventricular septum, and he had an abnormal coronary artery anatomy. His right and his left anterior descending coronary arteries came off um, from the same cusp, and his left circumflex coronary artery came off posteriorly. He ended up having the arterial switch operation with the Lecompte maneuver in 1995. He did really well without any symptoms for years, and then he started developing chest pain and shortness of breath whenever he played basketball. So we ran him on an exercise stress test, and all looked okay until you reach eight minutes of exercise where he developed ST segment depressions in the inferior lateral leads. He went to the cath lab, aortic root angiography showed good filling of the right uh, coronary and the left and the L LAD, but we didn't see the circumflex. And so they did selective coronaries, <coughs> showed great filling like we saw on the root, well, we really didn't see the circumflex here, but here on the lateral view, you can kind of see the distal circumflex diminutive being filled retrograde by collateral vessels. So we went to the OR and they confirmed what we saw or what we suspected during our cath, a chronically occluded left circumflex ostium and then an extremely small left circumflex coronary that was fed by collaterals. And he ended up getting a coronary artery bypass with the lima. So, you know, the arterial switch operation now is a preferred surgery for these patients, which detransposition of the great arteries. You do away the, with the systemic right ventricle, you do away with the intraatrial baffles and all of the suture lines that are in the atria, and you significantly reduce your risk for um, sinus node dysfunction and bradycardia and um, atrial arrhythmias. But it's not perfect. Like in the case of MC, you can get coronary artery stenosis. Now this is a relatively uncommon for now complication after the uh, arterial switch operation. And you can see it long-term and doesn't just come on um, immediately post-op. Sometimes these coronary artery stenoses um, develop decades post um, arterial switch operation. And you can also get neoaortic root dilation. About two thirds of patients who have undergone the um, arterial switch operation develop aortic neoaortic root dilation by the time they're 15 years post-op. And related to that, some of these patients get neoaortic valve insufficiency. And for the most part, these patients end up needing either aortic roots and or valve intervention. And I forgot, or I didn't forget, I actually intentionally left out, that our patient ended up also getting supravalvar branch pulmonary artery stenosis.
here, by the time he was 10 years old, this patient ended up having to go to the cath lab already and had a stent placed in the right pulmonary artery. And this um, AP uh, picture in the cath lab showed that he still had left pulmonary artery stenosis. Unfortunately, when we went back to the cath lab and did coronary artery evaluations, um, after he presented with chest pain again, a couple of years later, we found that we couldn't dilate this left pulmonary artery because dilation of the left pulmonary artery led to um, compression of the lima graft. So the ACCAHA guidelines for follow-up and testing um, for these patients who have underwent the arterial switch uh, operations recommend routine follow-up in these patients. So follow-up should be every one to two years, and that follow-up should include an EKG and a transthoracic echo. Every three to five years, more advanced anatomic imaging should be obtained with a cardiac MRI and a cardiac CT or a cardiac CT. And um, functional testing with an exercise stress test should be done. Now, obviously, in patients who are a little bit more symptomatic or who have at least moderate valvar regurgitation or um, at least moderate uh, ventricular dysfunction, um, more frequent follow-up is needed. So historically, the atrial switch and the arterial switch um, operations were the most common and more popular surgical repairs for um, simple detransposition of the great arteries. But the atrial switch operation was wrought with a lot of long-term significant complications. And so the arterial switch operation became the operation of choice and still is to this day. But it definitely isn't perfect and follow up with um, in conjunction with an ACHD specialist is recommended. And so these patients end up needing lifelong care um, in the long run or else you're gonna end up seeing a 20-year-old in the ER with chest pain.